Praise God. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you guys for coming up. Thank you, worship team. Amen. And uh, we're so thankful for our team. And hallelujah. Now, um, before we do, uh, before I introduce our speaker, I do want to go ahead and take up an offering. I know you guys haven't heard Ian yet, but just, you know, just give in faith, right? <laughs> give in obedience. Um, uh, we'll take up an offering tonight. We'll take up another, an, another, another offering on Sunday. Um, but uh, so if I could have a couple of guys come and help me take up an offering for Ian and... Um, <coughs> So thank you, Lord. You can make checks payable to Global Harvest Church, and all this offering will go to him tonight. Hallelujah. And um, I won't take out my cut or anything, so praise God. And uh, so, Father, we just thank you tonight. Lord, we, we're so thankful for what you're doing, for what you're doing in our lives and in this city. Thank you, God. Um, Lord, we just receive... Ian this weekend, and Father, what you have, the gifts that you've given to men and women, and Lord, uh, that what you've placed in the body, Lord, to strengthen, to establish, to encourage, and Lord, we just honor the gift tonight. We honor in our giving, we honor in our our worship, we honor in just our presence tonight, and thank you for what you're going to do throughout this weekend, Lord, we give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So if you guys will take up the offering. Um, I do want to welcome, I saw her, there she is. I want to welcome Dorma Claypool tonight for being here. And um, Dorma is a great lady, and I haven't known her a long time, but I really appreciate her. She's the pastor of Grace Place. And, um, you know, and hallelujah, becoming a pastor Late in life, that's exciting, isn't it? Right? Not saying you're old, you're just a little bit later in life. So we just bless Norma, and I just am really thankful for her and for her leadership in the city, for her prayers, for her intercessions, and we just honor her tonight. So praise God. Well, I want to welcome you guys, and um, I'll be really honest, I, I have never heard um, Ian minister, Right? It's so scary, and uh, no, um, but Joe Moody, and most of you guys know Joe, and uh, Joe, the last time Joe was with us, and she goes, you need to meet this guy named Ian Carroll. He's this crazy Irishman, and all these crazy things happen, and I trust Joe, and um, you know, we started dialoguing a little bit, and uh, I read his book, um, and I'm going to go ahead and give a quick plug. I know you're going to probably give plugs too, but... I read his book, Equipped for Glory. I read it um, in one day as we were driving to Galveston. And uh, I really enjoy as Jamie was driving to Galveston. Let me rephrase that, right? <laughs> yeah, it was great. And uh, um, I really enjoyed it. And I really felt that even though there are a lot of people talking about FIFO ministry right now, I felt like Ian had something very relevant and very fresh and very timely to say. And I appreciated his perspective. Um, so he's been here since yesterday. We've had a lot of fascinating conversations. And uh, I, I think he has um, a specific impartation, deposit, teaching, word, whatever you want to say for us, for our city. And so I just want you to receive tonight. And I just want you to be attentive and um, just receive from the gift that Jesus has given us tonight. Amen. So let's just welcome Ian as he comes. So praise God. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you've all never heard me speak. This is, uh, so I need to, need to get some things out of the way. First of all, I do not have an accent. All right. I speak the Queen's English. Um, and uh, so that means you all have an accent. Y'all have an accent, all right? All y'all have an accent. So, um, I'm from Belfast in Northern Ireland, which is still part of the United Kingdom. My wife and I moved. We were called to the United States 
uh, to be missionaries to your pagan land um, in 2001. So um, the, the, the weird thing is we get to choose to love the United States. So we've fallen in love with your country. Uh, sometimes I think we love it more than some, some of all y'all love it, but uh, uh, we, we get to choose to be here, and uh, we just love being in the United States. We live just outside Chicago, and I have no idea why. <laughs> Lord, help us. Um, the coldest, it hasn't been that bad. Actually, this everybody's talking about it's been quite a mild winter. The coldest it's been has been like negative 11 or something like that, so... That hasn't been too bad. What on earth? What, what on earth? Why do people do it? It amazes me that at some point, some you know, people were traveling across the United States and thought, oh, this would be a great place. <laughs> it must have been in July or August or something like that, and then January hit and they stayed. I don't know why. But, yeah, there is that pioneering spirit here in the U.S., isn't there? There is that kind of thing that's <clears throat> it's going to keep going. So I do have a couple of books. Um Thanks for the plug. This one came as a, as a result of a conversation with a good friend of mine uh, who you probably have heard of. Um, he was in our church. His name is Danny Silk. He was in our church, and we're sort of asking him, hey, Danny, you, you know, Bethel are doing all this supernatural juju stuff. They're doing, you know, prophet schools, worship schools. They, had a, they even had a school of evangelism at one point. They had a transformation school, which was for all their pastors. What, what are you doing for, like, apostles? I was like, nothing. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> and, you know, my board were there, and they were kind of saying, like, well, you know, we kind of feel in is, and, we, I, you know, I've had prophets call me out and talk stuff to me, and I'm like, well, I don't even know what it is. What is an apostle? I, I say in the back of this, um, I, I liken apostles to Sasquatch. <laughs> you know, some, some actually believe they still exist. <laughs> and a few people, a few people have seen them, right? A few pe- and, and, and a few people, uh, yeah, a few people have claim, claimed to see the Sasquatch. And, and, you know, but nobody's really sure what they're there for. Nobody's really, really sure. And I kind of like, and Danny said, well, maybe that's on you. Maybe that's something that God's calling you to do. So I embarked on a, on a journey that resulted in uh, me doing a bunch of stuff with emerging apostles. I like the term emerging because it gives us permission to explore um, and not have everything sorted, which is one of the dangers, I think, that there's been around the prophetic movement and people calling themselves prophets who clearly are not prophets. They just don't understand what a prophet is. And, you know, it's like I'm really prophetically gifted, therefore I'm a prophet. Well, it's not a continuum, right? It's not like I have, you know, so there's the prophecy thing that happens. The Holy Spirit falls and people go, you know, the, the unction of the Lord falls on them, to use the old phrase, and they start to prophesy. Even donkeys start to speak the word of the Lord, right? God can speak through any old donkey. I was going to say a different thing, but... And uh, so it's not like there's this prophecy thing, and then there's the gift of prophecy. Uh, so you, you start prophesying, and then you get the gift of prophecy, and this is awesome, and then you finally graduate to being a prophet. That's not how it works. And, you know, so anyway, I go, I'll go into that, some of that more in detail tomorrow afternoon. But this was the result of it. Uh, it's called Equip for Glory. I have another book about to come out in the next month called Seeing the Glory, which is all about the mystical realm and angels and stuff like that. So, um, And this is my wife's book. My wife uh, wrote this book. It's called The Voice of Love. My wife is a fivefold prophet. Um, we've been married for almost 31 years, 31 years next month. We have three children. Uh, people, I was having a conversation with someone, and I said, yeah, I've been married 31 years. Uh, at that time, it was 30 years. He's like, to the same person? I said, no. Because the woman I'm married to now is a completely different person than the woman. Like, I, I couldn't go back to that. I couldn't go, you know. She's, she's way better than she was 30 years ago. And she was amazing then, right? But So she has this book. 
We also have a couple of USBs back there. There are three USBs. One of them is the companion to this Voice of Love book, and it's probably 12 hours of video of teaching. Um, and the other one is my Mystical Realm book, which is all about exploring the unseen realm. Uh, and they're back there. And there's one other one, which is, there are only two of them left, and it's my most expensive thing. If you have no idea, if you're starting a ministry, if you're starting, I mean, I, I did it for itinerants. Um, and basically, I teach you how to make money, have an impact. And so it's called on-ramp. So I'll, I'll, I go through the process of how do you actually make money at this thing. Not that anybody I know is in it for the money, but I tell people that I have a lifestyle preference, and I, I realize it's a preference. I have other options, but, but I, like to, I, I have chosen to live indoors. I, I have other options. I, d I don't like those other options, but I also like to eat. Right? So um, I actually believe that part of the grace that's on an apostle is to break the poverty spirit, particularly around money and talking about money. But hey, we're not going to do that tonight. I'll try to keep it country as much as I can. So um, where's Martha, who's doing the bookstore? Here you go. You can take them both. Just my small lesson, thank you. All right. I need to open my water bottle, so. All righty. So I, I'm, I've been doing this for long enough in the U.S. to know that there are some words that I use that will cause you some confusion. Um, so Hebrews 11 is, is a chapter about what? See, you have only one syllable, faith. We say fear, fear, all right? We have two syllables. So sometimes when people are, I will use the word faith a lot tonight, and I prefer not to speak in, a, in an American accent, but I want you to understand me as best as you possibly can. So um, that's part of my job. So. I really felt God as it, I'm, I really felt God has sort of said s some stuff, and, and I, I want you to know I am an involuntary seer. So that means I, I, I don't, there's times I don't have a choice about what I see, and there's times I, I do have a choice, and I can dial it down and dial it up and all that, but there's times it interrupts me. And coming in here, uh, I was very aware, let me just put it like that, I was very aware of a bunch of stuff that's that's been going on um, and I really feel that even today this afternoon I was, I was just sort of thinking about it this afternoon and I, I feel that the enemy has had an assignment against this church but also against the churches in, in this city um, that there has been a, an actual assignment that it, that a that a witchcraft giant has actually um, stood in the way of what uh, God's people wants to do and you know, we can say, well, you know, God is all-powerful. He can just, like, come against it. But that sort of witchcraft giant, and sometimes with that witchcraft thing comes, uh, like, even people with good intentions cooperate with that. Um, and sometimes what happens with the witchcraft thing is there's also, like, a sexual immorality thing that goes on, um, that it's coupled with that, that there's also this, like, control and desire to control people, and I will bend you to my will because my will is his, his will. And that's how we get around it in Christian circles, but it's still witchcraft. Um, but but I feel over this weekend that that's actually going to shift. Um, like I, I feel I I have some small part to play in that, but I feel that that's actually about the shift within this within this region because we're not supposed to look at giants; we're supposed to look at fruit. <coughs> uh, you know, when Moses sent the twelve spies into the the promised land, um, he didn't tell them to look for giants. He said, tell me about the people. Are they strong or are they weak? Let me know what we're up against. But it was the fear of the giants that they came back with. And it's interesting that these giants were probably Sasquatches. So that's just for, <laughs> it's just a mess of your heads. Um, these were offspring of a different race. Like they, they weren't human. You know, that's in the Bible, right? Like I'm not getting any weirder than what's in the Bible. The Bible talks about other, other beings. You know, every angel isn't an angel. Right? 
you know, I, I prefer the term heavenly beings because what does a ruler look like? We know there are 20, you know, what does an elder look like? Sorry, we know there are 24 of them. What the rulers look like, what the principalities look like, what the powers look like, what the all these things. So, so we're, we're actually wrestling not against flesh and blood, but we're wrestling against these things. And I'll probably go into that a little bit more on Sunday and have a strategy around that. That would be great to have a strategy around it. So. But here's, here's the thing. Do you, do you believe that you can delay your destiny? So let me, just, let me just take a step back. I'm not a determinist. All right? I don't believe that God has a plan for your life. Sorry. That's a cop-out. And it's also scary because if you fall off that railway track, you're like, oh, my goodness, I ruined it. All right? I don't believe God has a plan for your life. I don't believe Scripture ever says that. Um, I believe Scripture says that he has plans for your life, and those plans are for good and not for evil. They're not to bring chaos or calamity uh, and all those kind of things. They're for prosperity. They're for hope, a future, all those. Those are the plans. God has hope. One of his plans is that you live in hope. Hope, Lahoma, right? There's something about that sort of needs restored. Like the, 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 this notion of being a hopeful place because I do believe the one with the most hope will have the most influence in government. Uh, but if you're always coming as a curmudgeon, you're, nobody's going to listen to you. But if you're coming with hope and hopeful solutions, then, then you start to get the, the years of government and the years of people in power, which is exactly what we're called to do. Like, I don't believe we're supposed to be prime ministers or presidents. Now, that's okay if you feel called to do that. You know, when, when, that's, when, when we're given models like Joseph... And Daniel, they served. They served in the most hope-filled way that you possibly can. I have a solution for you that means we'll, we'll avoid destruction. I'd love to go into that a bit more. But um, So here we are. Um, the, I'm not a determinist. right? I don't believe that God um, is... When, when the Scripture says that he's directing our steps... I, I don't believe that that means should I turn left or right. I, I believe that God will never violate his character, which means he has not made us robots. He has made us people with free will, and we make decisions, and he can adjust according to those. And we know that if it's not good, it's not the end, right? Because he works all things out to our good. And so that means if it's not good, then it's not over. So real simple. And that allows us to be hopeful. Anyway, so, but back to this word destiny. So I don't want you to think determinism when I'm thinking destiny. I'm thinking those promises God has made, made in, you know, over your life, those things, those desires of your heart. Well, you're, you're, you're going to say, well, how do I know the desires of my heart are from God? Because the Bible says he gives you the desires of your heart. Well, you can look at that two ways, that he gives you the desires of your heart, or you can look at it that he gives you the desires of your heart. So I like to believe that he gives you the desire, and he will give you the desire. Right? He will make a way for that. So if it's a desire of your heart, listen, the, with the fivefold stuff, I have a lot of grace for people that think they're apostles, prophets, and they're not, because it might be a desire of their heart. It might be something that they're recognizing that I was built for more. Like You know we all know that we're built for more. It's why Marvel is such a huge success. Because we all know that there's a superhero living inside of us. And we don't want to be Batman. Right? I don't want to be Batman. I don't want to have to you know, get a phone call from the police and then go and have to get ready and then drive for 40 minutes before I can solve it. And they're all gone. I, I'm built for more. Like, we know that we're built for more. That's part of why the, it's really important that we're a supernatural people. The world is sick with our prophetic lists telling everybody what's wrong. It's sick of it. They don't even want to hear it. Right? But there's this thing inside of us that knows we're built for more. Like Nebuchadnezzar said to Daniel, said to all his, you know Daniel's never called a prophet in the book of Daniel? Do you know what he's called? The chief magician. Can you imagine that being your appointment? I'm going to work for the government. What's your title? I'm the chief magician. I mean, most churches would kick you out. 
is to think he'd gone to the dark side. But no, he was called the chief magician. And Nebuchadnezzar said to all the magicians, says, you know, I don't care about your opinion. I don't care about your opinion. You can tell me your interpretation until the cows come home. I don't care about your opinion. Tell me my dream. Tell me my dream. If you're really good, tell me, tell me my dream. And if you can't tell me, I'm killing all of you. I'm done with this supernatural stuff. I'm done with it all. I am done with all your, you know, propheticlist.com. I'm done with it all. If you can't tell me my dream. We're sick of your opinions. And everybody out there is sick of our opinions. Well, let me tell you what's wrong with this, that, or the other. They're sick of it. They don't want to hear it. What they want, what they want is a supernatural people that are actually going to start to reveal the dreams that's in their hearts. That, that's what they're crying for. Nebuchadnezzar said that Daniel was as intelligent, as learned as every other magician. But he was ten times more powerful than the supernatural. So I'm going to go for the Daniel factor. I want ten signs and wonders for every opinion. That's the Daniel ratio. Let's make it the Daniel ratio. We're going to go for ten cancers healed before we get to have one opinion on anything. Right? We're gonna we're gonna get we're gonna get like ten infertile women pregnant. I'm not gonna get them pregnant, just to be clear. <laughs> it's amazing how things get misinterpreted. Uh, but we're we're gonna we're gonna have healthy children. We're gonna and for, we're gonna have ten of them for every we're gonna have autism healed, and for every ten of those we get to have an opinion. Because that for me is our focus, right? That should be our focus. The world is crying out for a supernatural people. Now, do you, know what, do you know what the Hebrew word for supernatural is? It doesn't exist. There is no Hebrew word for the supernatural. Because it's supposed to be his super and our natural. It's supposed to be this natural thing that we do. Now, there is a word called miracles and powers and all that kind of stuff that's in the New Testament. And, and we, want, we want everything, right? But we're supposed to be the most supernatural people on the earth. And the minute someone mentions meditation, you're like, is that New Age? She talks about the New Age movement. Glitter. Their eyes hurt. There's glitter falling on people. That's very weird. It's very weird indeed. I've been in meetings where feathers have been falling. And I've gone to reach out to the feather and, and this, this woman who was sitting close to me, just ignore it. It happens all the time. <laughs> not, not for me, it doesn't. In our church, one Sunday morning in our church, we had quarters. No, not a rain of quarters, but we had like quarters just dropping. And we have this old church building. And, you know, quarters just dropping. And people would get offended because it wasn't Benjamin's. Well, if it was really God, it would be $100 bills. We, like sometimes we go out of our way to be offended, right? Do you ever, do you, are you ever on the, you know, like you're, you're merging onto the, the freeway and there's a car who speeds up just to be offended at you? Have you ever experienced that? Like they speed up just to be like, no! Like, yeah, we like to be offended. Anyway, we're supposed to be a supernatural people. We're supposed to be walking in this realm. Where, where there is no difference. You know that he never... So I, I do this. This is a slight tangent. So close your eyes. Now I want you to imagine that you're praying to your Father in heaven. Okay, open your eyes. If you pictured a man sitting on a throne with a big beard, that's Zeus. That's not our Heavenly Father. And, and it's surprising how many people go, oh, wow, hmm. I've always pictured him like that. That's Zeus. That's how much influence, that's how, how, how much we are influenced by this Gnostic dualism that heaven is up there and earth is here. I have got really bad news for you. Heaven is not up there. Heaven is everywhere. We walk in the reality of a fused creation that God created the heavens and the earth, 
And it's our job to acknowledge, to come to the knowledge of the glory of the Lord that is currently covering all the earth as the waters cover the sea. But we don't know how to tap into it. We're thinking it's something else that we just have to reach. Listen, I've got, it's either really good news or it's really bad news for you. You ready? You are never going to be closer to God than you are at the minute. Ever. I just can't wait to be in heaven with you. You're never going to be closer to God than you are at the minute. Now, that's either really good news or it's a bit depressing. You see, we do not have a proximity problem. We have an awareness problem. Our, these, I mean, I'm assuming you're born again, that you believed in your heart and confessed with your mouth that Jesus is, in fact, the Lord of your life. And if that's true, then he's inside you. His spirit, the Holy Spirit, is living inside you. You can't get much closer than someone living inside you. And I don't, I don't know where, where, which part he lives, but that's even the wrong way of thinking, That like because we are this fused reality. We're supposed to be walking in the supernatural all the time, seeing what's going on, seeing what, what's all around us. And someone, someone's, you know, said something like, why, why are we looking at angels all the time? Because it's in the Bible. Like the word angel appears like 187 times in the New Testament, and the Holy Spirit, the, the phrase the Holy Spirit occurs like 60. It occurs more than prayer. Jesus himself was ministered to by angels. Twice it's recorded. But we, we don't need that. We're better than that, right? We're better than Jesus. We don't need ministered to by angels. But the problem is we don't know how to do it. No one's ever, no one's ever, t you know, we're going to have a being ministered to by the angels seminar um, tomorrow morning here. Right? That doesn't really happen. And, and I think the whole mystical thing is a bit like the prophetic was 30 years ago. And if you were in the church 30 years ago, um, go boomers. Um, the, uh, what would happen, and sorry for being like, sorry for being, um, uh, for picking on one gender more than, than the others. But what would happen in our church is that you would have six women that would go to this prophetic conference, and they would come back from the pr prophetic conference, and they'd be, oh, shaba, shaba, shaba. And, you know, they would come up, and they would start to, like, just preach or give the word of the Lord in the middle of worship or in the middle of the sermon, like disobeying all authority rules and all of that. Like, they would just have gone off and done it. And meanwhile, the senior leaders are not trained. They have no training in this. And all, all they can see is a bunch of scary people coming back from conferences who don't seem to know how to behave anymore. Who, who are the, the only people apparently on the planet where the spirit is not subject to man. You know, the scripture says the spirit. Well, I just have to speak it out. No, you don't. That's not scriptural. The spirit is actually subject to you. So you, that's not true. Bill Johnson took over, Bill Johnson from Bethel Reading, when he took over from, um, took over the church in Weaverville, uh, they had a woman who would, who would do this in, in the congregation. It's a congregation of about 100 people, and they had a woman who every Sunday would do this, and she had three words. And one of them was about women wearing makeup and telling those women that what they looked like. And... Uh, using a biblical term that in the King James Version that I won't use this evening. but um, so she, And she would just stand up. So Bill's first Sunday there, she stood up. Uh, he had a conversation with her after. He let it go, conversation with her afterwards. And um, next Sunday came, she stood up and gave the women or all women, you wearing makeup, you so-and-sos. And, and he just signaled the elders, and the elders came and picked her up and lifted her out. And apparently those that were there, there were windows all along the side of the building. And they could see the elders carrying this woman. She was like a plank. And they could see the elders carrying this woman. And she was still going, going at it, you know. And, and that's, that's where the prophetic was. But thankfully, there's been a lot of wisdom and a lot of, like, healthy people looking at it and a lot of good training and a lot of, you know, good stuff on it, including my wife's stuff. But there's been a lot of really good stuff, so it's less scary. We have protocols. We have all this. With the mystical stuff, we don't have any of that. We just have a lot of scary people coming in and saying, 
Are there, the, are there are four angels standing behind you right now, and um, meanwhile, the leader of the church is going, I see nothing, I, I'm experiencing nothing, I don't know what you're talking about, you're just scary to me. And, and part of my job, I think, is actually, again, to equip people in this whole mystical thing, is to go in and say, hey, this is really important. The Bible talks about different types of creation. It's not just angels and humans. Do you ever read the Ezekiel piece where um, he's describing the cherubim? And I, I've done this long enough, and people say, cherubim, they're those little round baby-like things. No, they're, they're a Roman god called Pudi. That's not, they're not cherubim. Like, Cupid is not a cherub. He's this Roman god thing. Uh, the description of the cherubim is really weird. In Ezekiel, it's really, really weird. And then there's this whole machinery thing connected to it, wheels within wheels, and it's, it's weird. The Apostle John goes to heaven, and he keeps saying, ah, you know what, it looks like this. But we're all good charismatics, so we're content with speaking in tongues. Right? Should have bought a Honda, bought a, bought a Kia. Right? We're content with speaking in tongues. And then there's this whole thing called the Bible where you've got people walking on water. Now, when Jesus is walking on water, what did they say they thought he was? A ghost. You know what a ghost is? Ever heard a sermon on ghosts? Like Peter is broken out of prison. There's the intercessors are all going. <laughs> marching, marching. You've got their prophetic swords out. They're doing all that, cutting the chains. I, that's that's what I imagine they're doing. Anyway, if it had been to any of the intercessory meetings that I've been at. And they're doing these prophetic acts, you know, break the chains for Peter. You know. And, you know, there's a knock on the door, and one of them goes out and closes the door, says, it's Peter. And what do they say? It's his ghost. So you understand that we look at the Bible. If you, someone, I get feedback quite a bit. I get a lot of feedback from people, which is awesome. And... Uh, one of the pieces of feedback I got today, which I then deleted and blocked, um, was <laughs> I only read the Bible. I don't need anything else but the Bible. We've all heard that, right? And if I was trying to be like a smart aleck, I would say, oh, I didn't know you understood Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Well done. Congratulations. I didn't know you had actually invested the bajillions of dollars you would need to invest to obtain the original manuscript. Well done. Otherwise, what they're doing is reading a committee who have decided this is what this is. They're, they're looking at the words of a committee who have made decisions about what things mean. And those committees are frequently like not super helpful. Has anybody ever heard a, um, a teaching on a teruma? Teruma. It's mentioned over 60 times in the Old Testament. Now, when I tell you what it, what it is, some of you will have heard the teaching on it, but using the phrase teruma, has anybody heard a teaching on tithing? Put your hand up if you've heard a teaching on tithing. The word tithe appears about 10 times. Teruma appears over 60. And teruma simply means first fruits. The most important offering that you can give in the Old Testament culture is your first fruits offering, right? And we've never heard of it. So there's this whole cultural piece that we miss out. You know there's a Jewish angelology? Okay, I'll break it down for you real simple. There are three real main periods of Judaism. There's little bits that are slightly different. But for, for, for me, for my purposes, because I'm a simple guy, there are three main periods of Judaism. First one? is Mosaic Judaism, right? And, you know, e even e Abraham, that, that from Abraham right the way through, 
that the temple was destroyed. And the temple was destroyed when Nebuchadnezzar came in and Babylon came in and just destroyed it. And then you've got Nehemiah coming in and rebuilding it. The, the significant thing that happened at the destruction of the temple at that time, by 400 and something BC, was that the presence of God never returned to the temple. The glory of God never returned to the temple, ever. So then you, you had this period of what's called Second Temple Judaism. And during Second Temple Judaism, which is what Jesus was trained in, uh, in that was his culture, within Second Temple Judaism, you had these things called Sanhedrins and Pharisees and Sadducees, because they're sad, you see. Bad joke. Hashtag bad jokes, come on. Right? Sadducees, Pharisees, um, you had this whole thing. Synagogues have come out within rabbinical, what's called rabbinical Judaism. And it started when the temple was completely destroyed in A.D. 70. And there, one of the things that marks rabbinical Judaism is that there are no longer any animal sacrifices. They don't obey the law of the Old Testament. <coughs> So there, there isn't just one sort of thing of Judaism. Now, within Second Temple Judaism, it's particularly applicable to Christians because that's where Jesus taught from. Jesus taught from this place of, of being a Second Temple Jewish rabbi. You understand that Jesus was a rabbi, that when they said rabbi, they weren't just like making it up, that he was actually a rabbi. Every male child was born and immediately... Being tr was being trained to be a rabbi immediately for the first five years of their life their father would take them and recite the book of Deuteronomy to them they, they couldn't read it they had to do it from memory so if the father didn't remember what it was then the son wouldn't remember it and the son would fail based on the father's failure so there's this whole thing so Jesus born tra being trained as a rabbi and, and it's the most applicable thing. So they, they're, they're filled with idioms. So Second Temple Judaism is filled with idioms. And there's a bunch of these idioms in the New Testament, but we miss them. So one of the classic ones is heaven and earth. Like the phrase heaven and earth is an idiom. And it's an idiom for the temple. It was the temple itself. So some would say that when Jesus is saying, you know, heaven and earth will pass away, he wasn't talking about heaven and earth. He was talking about the temple. That they would have understood that as this is about the temple. He's actually predicting the destruction of the temple, which got them incensed. And he did it. Yeah, anyway, you know, he, he went after the temple straight away. So you've got this, this thing where Jesus is being trained as a rabbi. And within Second Temple Judaism, um, that they drew from Mosaic Judaism, and they had an angelology. So within their angelology, um, every so if if you believe in, in generational curses, then the curse goes to what four or five generations? I can't even remember. But there is a generational blessing that goes to the one thousand generation. That generation or that generational blessing in um, in their in in Jewish angelology was stewarded by your family angel or your ghost. And within their angelology, your family angel, which they often referred to as your ghost or your spirit, they often referred to it as that, would look just like you. So that starts to make sense. Maybe it's his ghost. So as a seer, sometimes you'll see people and they have an angel and they don't look like an angel, you know, with the wings and, and stuff. They don't look like an angel. Um, they'll look just like the person. And when people start to engage with their angels, they, they'll like, hey, you know, I'm going to start. I, we're just off back from Mexico. We did a deep dive mystical retreat and I had everybody talking to their angels and introducing themselves to their angels and I was making sure it was all kosher um, and 
you know, this this one guy's like he's talking to his angel, and the angel's called like Billy. It wasn't Billy, but it was just a normal human name. And another one, the name was just something that was definitely in a different language. I was like, I said, well, well, they look very like you, so they're probably your generate. They're they're probably stewarding this generational blessing. So if people say, do you have a guardian angel? I don't know, but you've definitely got a generational blessing angel. There's something that that's that's on every that's on every human being that has this generational blessing thing. So that's part of that's interesting, right? That's kind of interesting. Understanding the culture is interesting. There are little idioms, and then you have the, the you have the oral tradition, and the oral tradition was sort of all written down in this book called the Mishnah. And I've read the Mishnah, and it's really boring, <laughs> and also fascinating because they do go into the angelology stuff quite a lot. Uh, demons. You know, we think demons are, you know, that sort of like thing. Um, <clears throat> and there's there's a teaching that, that uh, Augustine brought in. Do you say Augustine or Augustine? You say Augustine, okay. So I'm bilingual and sometimes I forget the words, you know, so... Um, Augustine, as I would call him, uh, didn't like the, the theology that was present during the first 300 years of the church and had been present within Judaism for, for millennia. He didn't like that, so he changed it and said they're fallen angels. The problem is there's no Bible for that. There is no Bible to say that, you know, demons are fallen angels. None. Can't find it anywhere. So we're wrestling against the, these demonic powers, and we don't even know who we're fighting for, fighting against. We have no clue, and we wonder why we're powerless. We wonder why like, the New Age movement seems to have more power than us. You know, if I went to Southern California and opened up a shop and said, I will align your chakras for $7,000, $1,000 per chakra, people would pay me to do it. Because I can align your chakras. It's just I'm not calling them your chakras. I'll get you, you know, anyway. Money. I just thought of a great money. <laughs> but we're afraid of it. We are afraid of this. We are selectively supernatural. Even in charismania, we are selectively supernatural. And the minute something else comes in that we're not familiar with, we get, I think it's the devil. It must be the devil, because I, I have more faith in the devil's ability to deceive than I have in God's ability to bless me. You see it so much in, church, in, in, in the Western church, where, where people are afraid, like leaders are, leaders are there, and we're trying to raise up leaders, and we end up, we end up with cultures that don't want to raise up another Judas Iscariot. And that sounds so good. We're, we're not going to raise up people that are full of pride. Amen? We're gonna, not going to raise... But the problem is you don't raise up any world changers. For fear of raise, raising a Judas, we don't raise up the Peter, James, Johns, Matthews. We're not doing that. And the problem with hanging around with Jesus is you think you're the best thing that has ever happened to the world. Like, if you hang around with Jesus, I think I'm the greatest. No, I'm the greatest. That's what the disciples were at. Let's ask our mom. <laughs> All right, well, we're going to bring our mom into this to see which one is the greatest. And, and we, you know, we're so afraid of it. We're so afraid of people having healthy self-esteem. So we're selectively supernatural, and we need to understand the context of Scripture. So the context of, of, of Jesus' life is that he is trained up until he's five, and at five he's given an oral exam. Recite the book of Deuteronomy. Now, he wasn't offered candy for learning a memory verse. He didn't get stickers or points or anything like that. He wanted to be a rabbi. It was drummed into them. Like, it's like playing for the NFL. Like, this is drummed in from you're a, you're a kid. This is the track that you're on. You're going to be a rabbi. And, if, you know, they would also have trained in their family business, but they would have trained as a rabbi. 
And then they would, they would have learned how to learn the entire Torah and the Psalms. Psalms are an interesting one. So in that culture at the time, um, no one would have said Psalms 103. They, w- they wouldn't have done that because they didn't. that's not how they organized things. If you wanted people to know what you were thinking, you recited the first two lines of the psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That's all you had to say. And everybody would fill it in. They would go. Which is interesting because Jesus is on the cross and he says, my, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we think that's the end of it. But everybody else in that culture would have heard the rest of that psalm. They would have heard the rest of that psalm, which ends up, but you have not, def- you have not abandoned me. You're with me every step of the way, and I will, I will be risen victorious. That's the rest of that. So it wasn't just Jesus depressing everybody. He was actually giving them a victorious message. You know, within the culture, it says, it says in the New Testament that they, they Passover and they sing the song that they left the Passover after Judas had gone. They left Passover and they're singing a song. And the, the song that they, the, the, it's from the Psalms, and the song that they were singing on the way to the garden, everybody in that culture would have known what it was because it's the fourth song of Passover. Do you know what it was? So this is Jesus. Whatever you do, Judas, do it quickly. Okay, let's go. Going into the garden. And they start singing, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad. And on his way to be crucified. But you got to know the tradition. It's interesting, just as an aside, there's, a, there's an old mystic, an old uh, Christian mystic called Joseph of Cupertino. And Joseph was around the 1700s. He would, he would go into these ecstasies with the Lord and they would have to tie a rope onto his ankle because he would start to levitate. And, you know, there are actually some reports here in the U.S. of some Catholic brothers who are doing exactly the same. They're just getting into this, you know, ecstasy with the Lord, and they're starting to levitate, and people are having to hold their, their cassocks. Crazy. And Joseph was this real unlearned man, but just had this real intimate relationship with, with God. And... He was asked by one of the bishops, um, what, what, what do you think Jesus' greatest anguish on the cross was? What was the bit that hurt most? Like, was it the beatings? Was it seeing his mother? And Joseph said, it was losing Judas. Because somehow we think the minute someone betrays us, we then have the right to not love them. That we now have a legal right to treat them the way they treated us. And that's not the Bible way. The Bible way is treat people the way you want to be treated. So anyway, that was just for free. So we've got to understand the culture. Jesus is being trained. Here he is being trained. Has to remember all the Psalms and the Torah. And then at, at the age of 12, they're brought in to the synagogue. And they are questioned by the elders of the synagogue. And they are judged largely on the basis of their answers. No, they're judged largely based on the questions that they can ask. So if you read Jesus' life, where do you get your authority? Well, who gave John his authority? He answers questions with a question. This is the Jewish way. This is the Hebrew way. That, that I, my understanding of a topic is based on how, my, how good my questions are. So you have this thing in Luke 2. <laughs> Y'all doing okay? So you have this thing in, in Luke chapter 2, and they're visiting Nazareth. Nazareth, And it says, now his parents went to Jerusalem. Talking about Jesus, capital H on his, so it must be Jesus, his parents. Was Joseph his father? Trick question, right? Of course, yes and no. wasn't really his biological father, but Scripture seems to say he's his, he's his father. In fact, earlier on in this, it, it says in verse 33 in Luke uh, chapter 2, and his father and mother were amazed at the things that were being said about him. So Joseph 
is known as Jesus' father here. Okay? It's really important. So they visit Jerusalem. Three days they're gone. They realize Jesus isn't around. I don't know how you do that. Uh, it takes a village to raise a child, apparently, and they thought Jesus was somewhere three days. I mean, we've all had the, you know, 10-second Walmart terrors, right? When we were our children, oh, my goodness, <gasps> and you're looking for them, and you're either going to kill them or you're going to smother them with kisses. You're not really sure what your reaction is going to be when you fi finally find them. So they're having this for three days, and they go back, and th they walk in, and they, and they, they see him. Verse 46, then after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all of you, now we would just skip over that. But this is part of his journey. This is part of his destiny. Right? He, he's being trained to be a rabbi. There were two different kinds of rabbis. There was a rabbi, and a rabbi, and then there was a rabbi, they, they call it this, the they call it a rabbi with shmika. It's the Hebrew word. It just means authority. I actually have the Greek word on my arm. It's exousia is the Greek word for it. But in Hebrew, it's shmika. Now, shmika was both a process and something that people recognized that you had. So this authority thing was a process. So when, when Moses is told to lay hands on Joshua and give him some of your authority, that was called Shmika. Laying hands on someone to transfer authority is called Shmika. Say Shmika. See, you're all Hebrew scholars, right? Every rabbi up until the third century could trace their Shmika back to Moses. They would be able to trace this right the way back that so and so laid hands on me, laid that, that right the way back to Moses. Uh, even within the historic churches, the Orthodox Church, the Catholic Church, the Anglican community, they have this thing called apostolic succession. And they can trace the process of them having hands laid on them by their bishop right the way back to Peter. So we, we have this as, as part of that. It's part of something, right? It's part of a historical thing. Uh, it's not just an isolation, right? It's part of something, Jesus' culture at the time, and we get to enjoy the benefits of that if we understand it. So here he is. Uh, and all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when they saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us this way? Behold your father. See, there it is again. Father, Joseph, and I have been anxiously looking for you. And he said to them, Why is it that you were looking? This is a 12-year-old boy. Now, he obviously was not brought up in an Irish home, talking to his mother like this. Why is it that you were looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand the statement which he had made to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth, and he continued in subjection to them, and his mother treasured all these things in her heart. I want to suggest that the church has got an authority problem. It's covered up. You know. that, that we don't know what authority is. And the minute someone steps in with authority, we get all like, oh my goodness, because I'm being controlled. We, we don't understand authority because we have stopped doing what Jesus has just done. So, This is how this works out in church. In church, this works out to say, you know what? I'm doing what the Lord has called me to do. I am a prophetic intercessor, and I'm carrying a sword, and I'm going to walk around this church building doing all this all the time because that's what I've been called to do. I have been called by God. This is my ministry, and no man will stop me. In fact, one of the signs of my ministry is people will reject me for my ministry. It's one of the, that's, that's how I actually validate my ministry is you all don't believe I have a ministry. Right? That's how we do it. You know, we, we, get, we get people like Daniel who's serving a demon king, a, 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 like a demoniac king, 
who sets himself up to be a god. And we think when the pastor tells us to not blow the shofar when the worship team are playing, that he's controlling or she's controlling. I won't be controlled. This is my ministry from the Lord. And we walk out in a sulk and we go and find a better church where we go through the same thing all over again. And, and you get, you know, I, I led a church for years and you'd get people coming out, finally I found that this place is really free. I love the fact that it's really free. Do you know why it's really free? Because we, we have boundaries. We, we've actually boundaries. Have you ever tried to light a fire just and scatter it everywhere and let, try to light the fire? No, you have to like bring it together and have a fireplace or a fire pit or whatever it is you're using. You have to contain it in order for the fire to burn. And that's not control. It's containment. It's actually given, like, do you ever try and, you're probably all beef eaters, right? You know, like your steaks here, yeah? Glory to God, honestly. Thank God for appetites and for cattle. Listen, I, I came across the greatest evangelism tool that I think we, we should start using. That Christianity is the only major religion where we can eat bacon. I mean, come on, that should be on our church billboards, you know. <laughs> Leave Islam. Come to us, we get to eat bacon. <laughs> Anytime we want. Barbecue. Pork shoulder. But, hey, come on. Anyway, do you ever try and cook a steak on one little, like, coal for on your barbecue? You don't, you don't do that because it doesn't produce enough heat. What produces heat is when you clump them all together and you, they start to, like, feed off each other and, you, like, they burn brighter and hotter and longer when they're all together, right? That's, that's the job of leaders. But, no, I'm doing my father's business. I am called to be a prophet, and the fact that you don't recognize it is an indication that I am, in fact, a prophet. Thank you. That is from the book of Ian, chapter 1. Right, we make stuff up. This is Jesus saying, this is what I've been put on this planet for. You've actually been training me, and I'm actually in my father's house. Now, they had no concept of what that meant in the temple, that it was his father's. They didn't know God as father. They had no concept of God. They had concept of El Shaddai, Yahweh. They had concept of all that. And, of course, in rabbinical Judaism, you can't even mention the name God. In this current, um, but, but it was fine. It's fine to call him by any, you know, Jehovah Jireh and all that. Well, it wasn't Jehovah, but. So they, they had no concept for that, but this is Jesus saying, I've been put on this earth for this purpose. I was built for this. And his mom said, that's lovely. Now get home. And it said he subjected, he continued in subjection to them. In other translations, it will say that he submitted to him. He can, submission, you come under someone else's mission. I am under someone else's mission. I have cast my mission aside, and I'm under someone else's mission. That your mission, mom and dad, are now the most important things. And it sounds that we're, we're setting aside our father's call for the sake of something earthly. It's not. This is the kingdom. And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. If Jesus had to grow in favor with God and man, do you not think we need to grow in favor with God and man? Like, we need to be able to grow in favor. And the prob one of the problems is that we, we think we have all this favor with God because we have no favor with men. Listen, it's time for the church to change all this. It's time for the church to start having favor with men. It's time, to, it's time to be the ones that, the, you know, I have, I have a friend who leads a prophetic company. This prophetic company are now starting to take over um, what, where the New Age movement had left off. And the, the local police are coming to them and saying, uh, we've lost a girl. Can you tell me where she is? And they have their prophetic company all gathering, and there's a, the, the, they're like secret agents. You know, the, they'll meet, and they'll be like, oh, it's super intense. Prophetic people are super intense. Who are the prophetic people? You're all superintendents. You tire me out. 
and they're, you know, they're all super, and, and they've actually got, they've found uh, young girls who have been abduct, abducted. We need to grow in favor with men. But we don't do that when we're actually saying, well, I'm doing the father's business. I am not talking about moral compromise. But when, when Joseph can serve a demon god king who actually gave him another name, do you know what his another name was? Do you know what his name was? It was like, you're a god, simply. You're the god of this, Joseph. And Joseph is walking around with people calling him a god. And we would, like, if that was us, we'd be like, so offended. How could you do that? Let them call you. Stand up for your beliefs. No, I want to have favor with men. And I'm not, I'm not a god. Well, they can call me whatever they want. Because I want favor with men so that I can see the kingdom come. And stop being so... See, you're, you're supposed to believe. If, if men reject you because of Jesus, we're blessed, right? If men reject you because you're an idiot, you're just an idiot. <laughs> That's it. Good job. Way, way to raise that bar there. Like, I'm foreign, so I get to speak into a bunch of stuff. I'm foreign. I can play my foreign card anytime I want, right? 1776. Let's talk about 1776. We want a replay. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> well, you like, I mean, when did, it, when did independence become a kingdom quality? Anyway, you can repent anytime. I'm pretty sure the queen will take you back. Not Meghan Markle. She's not coming back ever again, but, you know. <clears throat> so the weird thing is, like, I was a cop. I was a cop in the hardest spot. You probably all, if you're my, my age, you might even have seen me on TV uh, during all the riots and the murders and the atrocities that were happening in Northern Ireland. I'm in the hardest place as a young single man because they wouldn't let married men be in my unit because if you were going to die, they didn't want married people to die. Like, it was hard. Super macho, but really hard. And the thing about me is I took an oath to a person. That's the difference between royalty, is I take an oath to a person, not to a document or a, or a piece of cloth that means something really important. But, but, within, but within my culture, within this royalty culture, like I, it's the reason I'm not a U.S. citizen. I would love to be a U.S. citizen because I think covenant's really important. Um, but I won't do it until the queen dies because I took an oath. Weird, right? It's just weird. It's, got, it's, not, it's not like, hey, you know, it's just it's a different system. It's a different understanding. When we're actually saying that this is not about what this piece of paper says, this is about my commitment to a person. And Daniel's like that with Nebuchadnezzar. He's a demon god king. What about, what about Nehemiah? So I have a Nehemiah word for you, but I'll leave it to Sunday probably. Um, uh, what about Nehemiah? Has anyone ever saw the movie 300? Very violent. You shouldn't be watching movies like that. <laughs> it's a great movie. You, you know the guy Xerxes that comes in? And it's like this sort of, and that's a portrayal of him from some drawings that were done. That's either the dad or the son of, I can't remember which one it is, of Nehemiah's king. A demon god king. And he was protecting his life. He was the cupbearer to the king. He had a place of privilege. He knew how to grow in favor. He understood what favor looks like. And favor isn't fair. Because what happens is that the minute you start to rise in favor, Ardmore, whenever you start to rise in favor, people will say, what good ever come out of Ardmore? Right? Because it's not fair. It doesn't look like, well, you know, well, why not Chicago? We have, we're, a, we're a metropolis. We have, we're a transportation hub, and we're all hungry for revival, and we're a third African-American, a third Hispanic, and a third white. Why, why, we're perfect for a move of God. God picks Reading in the middle of nowhere. 
and it's cost you like $1,500 to go and visit for a day. All right? It's crazy because favor isn't fair. So what happens in actually, the, like, we don't understand how to walk in favor because we don't understand how to grow in favor. And growing in favor is about not man-pleasing, but it's just not being an idiot. It's not standing up for things that God has never asked you to stand up for. It's not, it's, it's, it's the world saying, I don't care about your opinions, tell me my dream. Have that kind of influence. So this is Jesus right there. Jesus decided that the, the, his father's business wasn't right there in the temple. His father's business was submitting to his mom and dad. We have it that the, the father's business is always submitting on a vertical plane. It's not how the kingdom sees it. The kingdom sees it as this, this matters. This really matters. One of the jobs of, of I think, the fivefold, and particularly the apostle, is to bring alignment. You can't have alignment if you're not actually calling people to do this. And this will create a shift in your region. Growing sons and daughters, not harlings, will create a shift. A holy shift. And I tell people this all the time. I think it's time to get our shift together. Because we're afraid of it. So here you have Jesus. Do you, so back to my original question. Is it possible to delay your destiny? Yeah. Go and do something dumb. Lots of dumb people doing dumb things, right? Go do something dumb, and you'll delay your destiny. Can you bring it forward? We're not so sure about that one. So every rabbi with authority... So the guy who was around, who was, he died probably when Jesus, or he died when Jesus was around four, was a guy called Hillel the Great. He was the rabbi with authority. Uh, his grandson was a guy called Galadriel. No, that's the Lord of the Rings one. Um, Gamaliel, uh, who was the Apostle Paul's mentor. So rabbis would go along, rabbis would go along, and, and they would look for young men. Sorry, it was only young men. And every young man wanted to hear the two words that a rabbi would say to them. So this rabbi was looking for disciples. And in the Mishnah, it says that they, they, were, look, they were trained to look for disciples who would, quote, in the, from the Mishnah, do greater works than they would do. Sound familiar? So Jesus is there, and Jesus at this point is a bit of a Tony Robbins character, right? He's known, and he's known as this guy who has authority, and he's walking on authority, but he's only 30. Most rabbis with authority were 60, 65. Even though life expectancy was about 40, these rabbis with authority were looked after. They were wealthy. They, had, they lacked for nothing. Um, and they would, tr they would go up to some young men that they'd been watching to see what they were like and seeing the call of, their, call of God in their life. And they would go up to these young men, and these young men would hear the NFL draft that they'd been longing for all their life in two words. And those two words were, follow me. Follow me. And Jesus goes on to say, and I will make you fishers of men. But in Matthew, he just goes, this is how he does it with Matthew. Follow me. And he walks. And Matthew has to decide right there, right then, even though he's doing a, a different trade, if he's actually going to follow this rabbi. And in those days, you followed the rabbi, there was this thing that you had to walk as close to them as possible, and you would be covered in their dust. And there's nothing, again, in, in oral tradition, there's nothing more important or honorable to a student of a rabbi than to walk in the dust of their rabbi. It's why when Jesus says, if you go into a town and they reject you, shake the dust from your feet. He wasn't saying, do that to them. He was saying, give them the thing that is the most honor. The thing that you carry that has the most worth to you, leave that with them. That's a different thing. And it's way more in character with who Jesus is than telling everybody, meh. So, Jesus goes up, 
follow me, follow me. That's what he's doing. These rabbis with authority, you know, once a generation a rabbi with authority came. It's why when the their So the woman caught in adultery, I've heard it preached a whole bunch of bad ways. The woman caught in adultery, they were coming to a rabbi with authority because the rabbi with authority, his, his job was to have what they called a yoke. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. Come unto me, all you who live, right? So they called it their yoke. And their teaching, they were allowed to interpret scripture. So not every rabbi interpreted scripture a certain way. Sorry, this is getting very granular. Woman caught in adultery, they come out and say, You're, you know, give me your authority on this. But we need to know what to do. Genuinely, we need to know what to do. What do you, what do you say? And Jesus said, well, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. And then he turns to the woman and said, where are those that accuse you? Because there has to be two accusers. And then he said, go and sin no more. Neither do I condemn you, and I go and sin no more. Right? So he, they're actually coming to the rabbi with authority. When they said to him, where do you get your authority? He said, where does John get his? Which is another thing, which is a rabbit trail, which I won't go into. Anyway. 60. 65, 70. Jesus fully, expe- I believe Jesus fully expected to not be who he was called to be until he was 60, 65, 70. One of the other ways you know that is because he picked all these teenagers. So there were only two of them above 20. That was Jesus and Peter. The rest of them were under 20. Because to be, to pay the temple tax, you had to be over 20. So there was only enough coin for him and Peter. That's all they needed because the rest of them were 15, 16, 17. Apostles at 17 years old, 16 years old, 15 apostles. Crazy. We think it's the retirement plan for pastors. Uh, we have never, never paid into a retirement plan for you, pastor, but, you know, if you retire, you can travel a little bit and greet in Walmart, and that should cover everything. That should be fine. Right? We think it's something else, but, but it, it, it's not. These, these young men were called to be apostles at 15, 16, 17. And then there were women called to be apostles. Fascinating. Church history is fascinating with some of this stuff. So, so Jesus is fully expecting this, and then along comes John chapter 2. Now, on the third day, so again, third day doesn't mean anything to you. Most Jewish weddings happened on the third day because it gave people a chance. So that was a Tuesday. So most Jewish weddings happened on a Tuesday because it meant people could travel and then travel back before the Sabbath. Uh, so most of them happened on the third day, just a bit of useless information. Not really because it's also like there's a resurrection thing to it and all of that. But there was a wedding feast in the Galilean village of Cana, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples were all invited to the banquet but with so many guests in attendance, uh, they ran out of wine. Just to be clear, it was wine. Right? Welsh's uh, technique of actually stopping fermentation of wine didn't come until about 100 years ago. We only figured out how to stop making grape juice into wine 100 years ago. This was wine. And it ran out. And the fishermen, the sailors arrived. I'm not saying it was because of the, of the fact that Peter and all that was there, but with so many guests in attendance, they ran out of wine. And when Mary realized it, she came to him and asked, they have no wine. Can't you do something about it? Now, Jesus said, I only do what, the father, what I see the Father doing, right? And Jesus replied, my dear one, or in the, some other versions it says woman, doesn't say mother, says woman. My dear one, don't you understand that if I do this, it won't change anything for you, but it will change everything for me. So again, that's an idiom in Hebrew. And it means uh, the actual uh, Hebrew idiom is something like, um, how will that benefit? How will that benefit both of us? 
So he, Jesus is saying, hey, it won't change anything for you, but it will change everything for me. My hour of unveiling my power has not yet come. So was Jesus lying? No, this is not a trick question. Jesus is not lying. He's saying it's not his time. So it is, is it his time? No. It's simple. Is he seeing the Father doing anything about unleashing his power? No. Heaven is not at work at all in pushing Jesus forward. Heaven's doing nothing about this. Jesus is saying this is not the time. I have probably 30 more years here. So heaven's doing nothing. And then Mary went to the servers and told them, whatever Jesus tells you, make sure that you do it. And you know the story. Now, there were six stone water pots standing nearby. They were meant to be used for the Jewish washing rituals. Each one had held about 20 gallons or more. And Jesus came to the servers and told them, fill the pots with water, water right up to the very brim. That's really important. Then he said, now fill your pitchers and take them to the master of ceremonies. And when they poured out their pitcher for the master of ceremonies to sample, the water became wine. In the Old Testament, water becomes blood and is undrinkable. And in the New Covenant, water becomes wine and is the best of wine. And, and this, piece, this piece of Jesus saying, fill, fill these washing... So, Jews would have to come in. I'm, I'm not going to get too graphic because I realize it's Friday night and some of you might be eating later. But they would, they would wash all the... There was no Charmin at the time, okay? So they would wash all the crud from their hands in these big washing things. They would dip dip their arms in, they would pick their nails, get everything ready to eat, because again, they didn't do knives and forks, they ate with their hands. So, all the dirt that they carried, and Jesus didn't say, empty it. He said, just fill it up. Because the capacity for Jesus to take all your crud, all the things that you're ashamed of, all the things that you've walked through, the capacity for Jesus to actually just say, okay, we're going to fill this up and we're going to transform what was horrible into the most beautiful wine possible, right? So people would understand reading this. But here's the thing. When he tasted the water that became wine, the master of ceremonies was impressed. Although he didn't know where the wine had come from, but the servers knew. And he called the bridegroom over and said to him, every host serves his best wine first until everyone's had a cup or two. Then he serves the wine of poor quality. But you, my friend, you have reserved the most exquisite wine until now. And this miracle of Cana was the first of the many extraordinary miracles Jesus performed in Galilee. This was a sign revealing his glory and his disciples believed in him. And then he goes off to the temple, fashions a whip. Jesus has just propelled his ministry 30 years forward by being submitted to his mother. It wasn't by being submitted to his heavenly father. That sounds super religious. But what, what actually happened right there, what happened was because Jesus said, yes to his earthly mother, all of heaven got busy. Like all of heaven realized that this is the kingdom. This is actually where the kingdom is born is through the submission of a son to his mother or the submission of a daughter to her father. This is where the kingdom happens. Like that's why it's honor your father and mother so that you would have a long life. And it's not just a long life that you want to live for free. It's actually so that you would have like a full life. Like this, this, this piece here is the missing piece in the church because we have a lot of teaching about, you know, we're children of God. Like I understand what it's like to be a son of God. I, I, I don't know if that's really true because I can't claim to be a son of God vertically 
if I'm not horizontally? Whose mission are you submitted to? Who are you serving? Who are you getting underneath and actually pushing up? Who are you doing that with? Or are we so intent on blowing our shofars and marching around like we're so independent? And the reality is God is good. Like he's a good father. Even if my child is in rebellion, I don't want to, I don't want to punish them. I don't want them to die. I want them to be as, I still want them to be prosperous. I still want them to be blessed. And what we've got is we've got people leading ministries of 30 people when they should be leading ministries of 30,000 people. But they have never learned how to grow in favor with man. Never learned it because it feels like we're no longer independent. We're not. I don't know who told you that. We're not independent. We're, you know, I'm not codependent either. I don't, I don't need you to love me for me to feel good. It'd be great if you loved me, but honestly, I don't need you to love me to, for me to feel good. Sometimes my wife says to me, I, I wish you could be a little bit more codependent. Like, no, not, not so much. But we're interdependent. We're actually dependent on, on everybody else. You understand that when, that when the Spirit of God falls in an area and it's really revival, that every church will be affected even if they pick it against the revival. They'll still grow and be blessed because he's a good father. And we can't get into that sort of bickering thing, that arguing thing of like, you know, I'm the greatest, no, I'm the greatest, no, I'm the greatest. <laughs> you all doing okay? What time do you normally finish it? Midnight? If you have to go, please be free to go. But this, I think, is actually, actually really important. This piece is really important. We, we one, of the, one of the calls in my life is to break passivity off the church. We're waiting on the Lord. We're just going to wait on the Lord. The Lord gave me a prophetic word, and I'm going to put it on the shelf and see if it comes true. Waiting on the Lord. You know that those that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength, not sit on their blessed assurances for the rest of their life. Like they shall walk, they'll run, and they'll soar. Like those that are waiting in the Lord will actually still continue to move forward. You know, Jesus got really mad at a tree for not producing fruit out of season. This is the kingdom, topsy-turvy. The, the, you know, if I want to be the first, I have to be the last. If I want to be the greatest, I have to be the least. If I want to be exalted, I have to be humble. We don't talk about that a lot. We talk about humility, right? Humility is actually just preparing to be exalted. According to the Bible, right? Because the exalt, well, I'm really going after humility. So, I, I, I'm fed up with the passivity thing. I, something else. Can I just give you another little... I'm in a wilderness season. It's a real wilderness season. Well, why don't you get out of the wilderness season? Honestly, now, I'm not talking about mental health, depression, all that. Like, please, talk to people. Get your heart healthy. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about this notion, well, God's not really doing anything in my life because I'm in this wilderness season. You understand that the wilderness was, was designed to kill off a generation for being rebellious? Is that the season you're in? Is he going to kill you off because you were rebellious? Well, they were in, they, Jesus was, was in the wilderness for 40, 40 days. I'll give you 40 days, all right? I'll give you 40 days throughout your entire life if you're going to argue that. All right? Do 40 days. And actually, do 40 days, but don't eat or drink. All right? And have all these mystical encounters and defeat the devil. Do that. Then I'll believe it's a wilderness season. But we make this stuff up because it sounds so religious. I really, and I'll chat on Sunday about trials. I believe trials come, but don't be troubled because I've overcome. In this world, you will have trouble, but don't be dismayed. Don't don't despair because I've overcome. It's all gonna be fine. All right. So, 
don't like the wilderness thing, don't like this uh, waiting on the Lord thing. God has given me a prophetic word. Well, we'll just see what he does about that. He has actually given you the prophetic word to see what you're going to do about it. Like, there, there was something, what's your daughter's name that was leading worship? Olivia. So Olivia's up here in the spirit realm. So in the spirit realm, what I frequently find that uh, worship leaders do a bunch of stuff in the spirit realm without having a clue what they're doing. But what was happening tonight during worship was the, the, like she was driving stakes into the ground. Like she's driving these stakes into the ground to say, we are going nowhere. Like we, are, we have, you know, been pressed in on every side, but we're not crushed. Like these were the stakes being driven in just during worship tonight. So that's just, a, again, for a freebie. So here, here we are, and we're expecting a Red Sea transition. So the Red Sea transition is a transition that happens to a people who are slaves and captured by a poverty spirit. Like, this is what happens. So the, the Red Sea transition, and I won't read the whole thing out. I'll read parts of it. Uh, no, I won't. So basically what happens is that the, the nation of Israel are they, they're commanded by God through Moses to go in between these two big hills and out onto a beach, and there's no escape. You can read it in Exodus 14 if you need to read it. And you can actually go on Google, Google Earth and see the place. And there's, there's like a big hill, big hill, gap, out, beach, Red Sea. And they're like, you've taken us here to murder us. He's going to, like, Pharaoh's going to, and God's saying, yeah, I want Pharaoh to think you've gone raving mad. And, and what are they told to do? Like, you understand your speech can actually abort the promises of God in your life. Well, you're getting very weird there. No, I'm not. Like the angel, I am the angel Gabriel who stands in the council of the Almighty God. Now, Zacharias, shut up. Because if you don't stop talking, this miracle baby won't happen. If you can't talk about the promise and can only talk about the problem, then the miracle won't happen. Because life and death are in the power of the tongue. That's why you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth. That's why the enemy uses slander and accusation to actually come at the church, because they're both spoken. That's why prophecy has to be spoken, not just thought. Well, I'm just prophesying over you in the spirit. No, it has to be spoken. It is the seed of God. It is this sperma is the word that God is actually planting to see if you're going to grow it. And what he always allows to happen is he always allows tares to grow up beside the wheat. Always. And you're not even supposed to pull the tares out. Because you know what happens? You know how you know that wheat, you're all, this is farm country. Do you grow wheat down here? Wheat, when fruitful, bows. That's how you know it's ready. That's how you know it's the kingdom. So, they're in a trap. There's no way out. They have no option except for God to break through. That is the transition season of a slave, an enslaved people group. There's only one option. There's only one way. There are two ways this can work out. We're all going to get killed or God needs to break through. That never happens again. That never happens again. That was a one-off. What happens again is in Joshua chapter 3. Remember, they've all died off. All the people who were in rebellion except for Caleb and Joshua, they've all died off. Now, it's really, it's really easy. So when you, the, Israel crosses the Jordan. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and he and all the sons of Israel set out from this place and came to the Jordan and they lodged there before they crossed. And at the end of three days, the officers went through the midst of the camp. And they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God with the Levitical priests carrying it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. However, there shall be between you and it a distance of about half a mile. Do not come near it, that you may know the way by which you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. The word of the Lord. 
this transition that's about to happen, that has even started to happen in this region, is like nothing you've ever seen before. People are going to say, it looks like the Red Sea, so we should just do what we did in the Red Sea. We should wait until the Lord moves. We're going to wait until the Lord moves, and then this will be the transition. We'll know when the Lord, when the sea has parted, we'll know that this has happened. This is not the transition of a free people. The transition of a people that are called by God to do great and mighty things looks like tension. So this time, remember, Moses, Shaba, sees part, we've all watched the movie. Or the cartoon. We've all seen it. I don't think VeggieTales ever did one about Moses, but if they had, I'm sure it would have been amazing. This is different. When you come to the edge of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. Awesome. So I have to go, and remember the Jordan is in flood, it says. The Jordan has actually flooded its banks. So before I even get to the edge of the Jordan, I'm actually walking in flood water. And it's up to my ankles and maybe up to my knees and maybe up to my waist. And I'm standing there with the presence of the Lord on me, not knowing if this was actually going to work. And then God in his infinite wisdom decided he would stop the waters like a couple of miles upstream just to build the tension. And in the meantime, the people of God who have this amazing call, they're a free people, they're about to walk into their destiny, and they have to get wet. The priests have to go and stand and get wet. And the water is held up until they're right in the middle of it, thinking, this is never going to happen. I wish it happened like it did at the Red Sea. That would be great. But it's not going to happen like that. See, the eyes of the Lord are looking across, are going to and fro across the, the world, looking for people that are saying, no matter what, no matter what the cost, if this costs me everything, I'm in. That's what God's looking for, people to say, okay, let's do it here. Strategically, it doesn't make sense. Well, let's do it here. And I actually think he's doing that with many centers across the United States. I think he's doing that with many places. I think we had prototypes of it in the 90s where God would move sovereignly in an area and then move sovereignly in another area and sovereignly in another area, and it wasn't sustained. I think Toronto was sustained, but the rest of them weren't sustained. And I think he's, he's looking at the U.S. at the minute going, okay, we're going to move. We're actually going to do some stuff. I, I, don't care, I don't care about your politics. My politics is God save the queen. Okay. But it's interesting to me that in the, in the fivefold, we, you know, I, the apostle is the gift. It's not their abilities. It's actually the person is the gift. And it's been interesting for me as an outsider to observe that what our current president is doing is he's talking more about the president than the presidency. He's talking more about the person than the office. I find that fascinating and really hopeful that there's a recognition that it's the person. So I think God is like going to do something remarkable, but you have not been this way before. It might feel like it. It might smell like it. It might bring back some memories of similarities, but this transition requires us to move before God moves. Yay! That's the thing. And, and there are going to be people that are not going to want to get their feet wet. There was a whole tribe stayed on the other side. They're not going to want to go with you. As a region even, they're not going to want to go with you because they don't want to get their feet wet because I remember the Red Sea. And that's the way it should always be. 
God should move, then we follow. That sounds great. Except when he said, I actually want you, I want you to believe in the promise, not the problem. I want you to believe in the thing that I've spoken over your life, over the life of this region, this church, the churches in this region. I want you to believe in those things. I want you to actually pretend that they're true and behave that you actually believe that they're true. You know that you can have dead faith. See, there's that word faith. You can have dead faith because faith without works is death. So it's all this believing, believing, believing. Well, you have to put some stuff behind the believing, right? And get rid of some of these. Like I can tell my wife a lover means nothing. If I, don't, if I behave completely differently. So I think God is actually going to stretch the region in this. It will come about when the soles of the feet of the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the, the Lord of all the earth, rest, stand still, rest. Stop getting agitated, stop getting frenzied, but do stuff. A guy called Banning Liebscher once said, the difference between people that do stuff and the people that don't do stuff is that the people that do stuff, do stuff. Genius. You see, God cannot steer a parked vehicle. You will hear a voice behind you saying, good job. This is it. This is the way. That was, anybody watch The Mandalorian? This is the way. If you haven't, that's okay. We forgive you. All right, so you hear this voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Not in front of you. My word is a lamp unto your feet. So I've climbed all over the world. You know where the most useless place to have a lamp is? Your feet. I want to see what's up there, which means I have to have one on my head. I want to see what's up there instead of like constantly looking at my feet. You know, he's directing our steps. But let's believe that he's actually directed your steps, that he has spoken. And you, you probably don't need another word. You probably need to do the, the, the original word. You probably need to do some stuff about that. And then, of course, they're in this. I, I love this bit. You know, you've got the priests who are standing with the presence of God, you know, the ark on their shoulders, and all the people have walked across. There's no enemy coming after them. This is an act of their own will. They're deciding that even though we're not being pursued, we're going into the promise. And they have to deal with the tension. And the, the priests are standing there holding this, and they're, everybody's walking past them. And once everybody gets out, Joshua says, I think I'd like to gather some stones. Why don't we gather some stones? Hey, go on down there. You stay there just a little while longer. Because there's part of it that it takes a little while longer than you think it's going to take. I'm very suspicious of these words that are like, you know, you're just going to walk right into this. You're not going to have to. That's nowhere in Scripture. Right? Even Jesus himself had to turn water into wine. He had to submit to his mom. He had to make some decisions about where he was going and what he was doing. And all the priests who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm and dry ground in the middle of the Jordan while all Israel crossed on dry ground. And then, of course, they, they go into this place because it's not what you, you haven't been this way before. So you're, you're going to be in the middle of some transition in, a, say, 18 months' time. So you're going to be in the middle of some significant transition, say. But you're having to make some decisions about, you know, expansion and favor and what does this look like. And, and you're going to be right there and you're going to think, well, this is going to be the way it is. This is the way it's all. You have not been this way before. You simply haven't been this way before. And it's great to learn from other people and get their blueprints and get their plans and all this. But you you they haven't been this way before either. And you're going you're gonna to realize that wait, I don't think God's with us anymore. Because you remember he used to give manna? 
and now we have to f figure out how to cook. Is there a McDonald's close by that we could, is, you know, is there a Chick-fil-A in Jericho? Maybe we should go and ask. Right, because you haven't been this way before, and it, you can even start to look a bit nervous. And what happens even to the, like they haven't circumcised anyone in 40 years. If you don't know what circumcision is, please ask Andy afterwards, and he'll give you a full breakdown. <laughs> You don't YouTube it. That was probably a really bad idea. <laughs> so they call all the men together for a circumcision party. Woohoo! <laughs> like even walking right into the promise of God, even those steps right into the promise of God, the fulfillment of promise doesn't even look like what you thought it looked like. And you're asking me to do what? Right? I, I just, you know, just got married today, and you're asking me to do what? No manna. Even manna, though, like we make manna something that we don't have to do anything about. God, why would you just provide manna? You know, manna was like seed, like a coriander seed that they had to grind up, add some water or oil, and then make into bread. There's work even with the provision of God. You're in a rural area. I, I minister in Bakersfield, you know, real rural area, farmland. And bumper harvest sounds great until you're not getting a day or an hour off and you're working until 1 o'clock in the morning and getting up at 4 for weeks on end to bring this bumper harvest work. And, and part of it, I think, is God is looking for a people that are saying, yeah, we'll do this. 1994, Randy Clark went to Toronto. I would say my wife and I would not be here in the United States if it wasn't for what God did in Toronto, what Randy's ministry and John and Carol's ministry did. It didn't just happen didn't just happen. John and Carol actually moved from their church in Stratford, Ontario, planted in, in Toronto. They had a church of about maybe 200 people, and they trained 300 people from all other churches on how to pray for people. They'd, they'd been doing that for six or eight months beforehand. They'd been going everywhere, pursuing impartation wherever they could get it. They met with Randy at a vineyard uh, leadership thing, and John heard that Randy had been to some of the places where the, that John had wanted to go and said, hey, why don't you come on up? We're going after this. And the minute, it ha the minute that night happened, they said, this is it. Stay. This is it. And I think the world has been changed because of it. My life has certainly been changed because of it. It's not happenstance. We can pray for revival all we want. I think God's praying that, not that he prays, I don't know if he prays. He probably talks to each other, so yeah, I've got communication with the Godhead, maybe. I'll ask the theologian. Maybe you could. But I think God's waiting for us to happen. We're waiting for revival to happen, and I think God's waiting for us to happen. That we have a responsibility to show up in our own lives. This is not some self-help thing. This is actually the call of God that's on our lives. We have a responsibility to stop waiting, learn how to be sons and daughters, and steward the gift that God has given us. There will always be opposition to the word. So we raise up prophets. We intentionally go after raising up apostles and prophets. With every prophet, one of the things that marks a prophet is that it has to be built inside them before it can be built around them. That they have to go through what being a prophet actually looks like inside before it can be built around you. Some of you have got words over your life that need to be built inside before they will ever be built around you. And being built inside means that you're actually going to have, have to fight some battles for them. You're going to have to fight a war for them. Because we are in a war. I hope you know we're in a war. It's not a war between God and the devil. It's a war between us and the devil. 
right? So we're, we're actually at a war. And those words, that they're probably some of the most significant words that you can imagine. They're represented even in this room. And God, God needs you to build in here before it can be built in, out here. Because our job is to be bigger on the, the inside than we ever are on the outside. Because when it happens, like in reverse, when people are bigger on the outside than they are on the inside, they get destroyed. They fall. That's the Christian euphemism for, yeah, make bad decisions, pursue other pleasures, other temptations, because they've never bothered to do the, the, the actual work on the inside. That if God has called me to the nations, if God has called me as a prophet to the nations, then I need to work on this on the inside before I'll ever print the business card telling you what I am. Let's stand. So this, this is what I want you to do. I want you, I want, so I'm, I'm an old vineyard guy, so we assume the position. Do you know what assuming the position is? Yeah. It means you just, I, I believe we are a fused reality. We're body, soul, spirit, heart. We're all that things in one entity. And I think what we do with our bodies is really important. So you, you know that you can't receive with a closed hand. That's not just a tithing statement. Um, you, you actually can't receive with a closed hand. And, and I don't think that's just in a physical way. I think it opens up more than... But I think physically we also open up our minds, our souls, our hearts, our, our spirits even. So God, I, I just pray even right at this moment that we would become more aware of your presence that we would be aware that the Most High God, the God of all creation, the creator of creation, it's a very Irish, that's a very Irish phrase. St. Patrick used it quite a bit. The creator of creation is living inside of us. Jesus more of more awareness of you God I pray you would touch us touch our touch our spirits touch our minds touch our hearts touch our bodies more Lord some of you might be experiencing a little shaking or a little flutter thing that's going on and, and I just think that that's, that's God sort of like getting you ready for more you understand that to receive more there is a, there is a pressing down and then a filling Things have to be shaken and pressed down before there can be a filling. So God, I pray that you would shake us, not in any like chaotic way because the plans you ha have for us are not for chaos. They're not for calamity, God. So I'm not, to, I'm not talking about calamity. I'm just talking about this shaking that needs to happen in what we believe and how we think and how we feel and what we've been given to. And God, if that, if that even means that you're going to undo 60 years of deception, then I pray that you would undo 60 years of deception. That the you know the problem with deception is that it's very deceiving. Nobody thinks they're being deceived. But God, that that we would have a clean heart, Lord. That we would have a pure heart, e even in, in realizing that what got us here will not get us there. Lord, the things that brought us to to the Jordan won't actually get us across the Jordan. We're going to have to behave differently. And God, I pray for grace even in this season. 
I pray for an outpouring of grace in our lives even tonight, Lord. May the spirit of grace be upon you. And God, if ever we need your fire, it's right now. Let your fire fall, Lord. Let it come. Let it come, Lord. More. I want you to stay there. Just stay where you're at. So God, I just release dreams and visions, Lord. Your, your word says that, 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 that it's time for old men to dream dreams. I'm assuming that's old women as well, but whilst none of us are old men or women in this room, God, I, I pray that even right at this minute you would start like reawakening dreams, Lord, just reawakening dreams. God, dreams that have actually been really scary and that the enemy has come in like a flood, Lord, at times, that the enemy has come in like a flood and, 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 it, and it feels like he's, he's swept away those dreams. And God, I pray that we would be strong and have great courage, not feel strong. We're never told to feel strong, that we would be strong and have great courage. Lord, I pray right now for an impartation of strength and courage for all that you're going to do, Lord. The tenacity, the strength and courage for all you're going to do in this region. God, God, you're not going to give us authority over something we don't love. So would you light the fire of love for this region in us, Lord? That what others have said, what good can come out? Lord, that we're saying that, that this that this is a center for revival, for the kingdom to come, that this will be on the map. This region will be on the map as a place where people will walk in and get healed, that they will start to sense exactly what's going on, that they'll walk into churches. Even God, I pray for the churches that even don't believe in this stuff, that they'll walk into churches and people will get set free from their demons, Lord. Lord, would you give us the strength and courage, an impartation of valor, Lord,
You see, courage gets you into the fight, but it's valor that freezes your hand of the sword. God, that you would give us an impartation of valor, not, not just for our sakes, but for the sake of this region, Lord, that we would rise up as the answer to the prayers of every mother and father, to the prayers of every grandmother and grandfather for their children and grandchildren. Lord, that we would rise up as being people that are, that are the answer to those prayers. Lord, for everyone that is, that is sick and struggling, that they would hear about what you're doing in this place. Lord, for every orphan that's out there, that you would put them in a family. Lord, for, every, for everyone that is broken and discarded, that you would actually breathe hope. Hope, Lord. We speak hope into the ground. We speak hope into this land that this is a place of hope and where the enemy, of course the enemy comes in and tries to steal your hope. He doesn't want you to be hopeful. It is a strategic weapon of warfare when we are the most hopeful people on the planet. Lord, where the enemy has actually come in like a flood, we stand in the water still and at rest knowing that we are carriers of the presence of God that we are carriers of the Most High God. And Holy Spirit, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. We honor you. We thank you for what you've been doing. We thank you for all that you've been doing over these last years. We thank you for the victories won. We thank you for the lives saved. Like people have, people's lives have been saved through you, Holy Spirit. And still people are afraid of you. So Holy Spirit, just have your way in this place. Just have your way in this place. It is time for the weak to say, not feel it. It's just time for them to say it. But God, I pray for dreams and encounters tonight, Lord. Like not Saturday night, I mean tonight, Lord. Let us, let us go home and have dreams and encounters. Let's have angelic visitations tonight, Lord. Let's, let's see your glory. Let us see your face, Jesus. Let us see the goodness of God in the land of the living. God, I don't want to wait until I'm dead. I want to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. So who's got tingling on their hands right now? Who's got tingling on their hands? Do you want to come on up? People with tingling in their hands. Like I mean tingling, not just I'm t- my hands are tired. Like they're getting tingly. <coughs> Anybody else? I might need some help from strapping young people. If we could just even stand behind one of these folks, that would be awesome. All right, so those with tingling, just make sure your hands are so that I know who you are, all right? So I believe what the Father is doing right now is he's actually like stirring up the gift that was given to you that you've been given a gift and he's stirring it up. And this is actually for the healing of the nations. This isn't just like political healing. This is God moving in you with an increased anointing of physical healing. So so do me a favor, and I realize this might be a bit weird. Try and bring your hands in without touching them. I want you to bring your hands in and don't touch them. And I want you just to be aware I want you to become aware. I don't want you to touch your hands, right? I just want you to become aware of flow. I want you to be aware of of, of an energy that's there. It's not just energy. It's spirit and life. And I want you to ask the Father, just in in your own heart, I just want you to ask the Father to increase that, just to increase it. 
So God, I just release more power. More power and authority, Lord. More, increase it, increase it. And God, I pray that these hands would see tumors dissolve, Lord, that these hands would see, uh, <laughs> yeah, that these hands would see brokenness restored, brokenness in the body restored, Lord, that, the, that these hands would see metal dissolve, that these hands would see all the testimonies that we've heard of. God, I, th there is... I, I just have this picture, Andy, of just this. There, there's a memorial wall that's going to be built around this place, and it's going to be filled with crutches and wheelchairs and CT scans and all of this. There's going to be a, a testimony or a memorial wall that's going to be built around this place. Um, I don't actually think it's this building, but I think it's going to be around the ministry that's in this place, that it's going to be this testimony to God's goodness. It's not just revivalists of the, of the past, but that it's actually, it is really going to be doing some stuff. Uh, now, God, I pray for, for an increase, an increase in his life of the ability to carry favor. Like, I, I think both you and, and Jamie have, have, have done, rem like, I, I mean, the Lord, you, you know this, but the Lord is saying, well done, that the assignment has been both against you guys and against this place, that this isn't just, this has not been nothing. This has been an unfair fight. And, and, and coming out of it well is amazing. But I think it's time to prepare for favor. I think it's time to prepare for moving out of this season. And God, I want to just declare, um, like with all the authority that I have, God, with all the authority I have, none, th none left, I want to declare that this season has now officially ended that this season is is over and done with. Um, now, that's not to say there still won't be trouble, but that this season is over and done with, and that this next season is a season of multiplication, that you're going to witness multiplication, not addition, that it's not addition is not going to be it. It's going to be a season of multiplication. So, God, I pray for more power, more power, more fire, more fire, more. <laughs> I, I just see, like, like even children coming in who have got like shackles on their leg, not shackles, but sort of braces on their legs that, that are trying to correct something that is, that is in, you know, that they, they just need alignment. <laughs> and this is going to be their place of alignment. Jesus' name. So more, Lord, more. You've been hungry for this for a long time. So God, I pray for, a, for increase, 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 Lord, increase of fire, in, increase of power, increase of authority in Jesus' name. More, Holy Spirit, more. Yes, let your healing flow, Lord. Let it come, let it come. Yeah, there's even more to this. This is this is going to be by impartation. You're going to heal people by laying on of hands. But I feel there's a, a writing thing as well that you're going to be like writing some stuff down, whether it's blogs or books or something, but you're going to be writing some stuff down that it's going to come in multiple ways. So God, I just pray for an increase right now of fire and glory, Lord. Let it come. More, Lord. Fire and glory, Lord. Let it come. More. Yes, Lord. Yeah. You're, you're a man who's prepared to be more undignified. So when you're a man who's prepared to be more undignified, a heart of worship, Lord, a heart for the Lord, a heart for the goodness of God, God, I, I, I know this man works in heart health. He works in deliverance. But, God, I pray that it would go beyond all that, Lord. I think it would, it would be, Lord, spirits of a f infirmity, Lord, that he would have a, that he would smell them. That he would start to smell these foul creatures. And know what to go after. More power. Yeah, 
last morning. Yeah, I love glory seekers, Lord. Glory hounds, Lord. Let it come, Lord. Let us see your glory. Let us see your glory. Let us know your glory. More, Lord. More, Lord. Yes, Lord, an increase of anointing to see the blind, that the blind would see, the lame would walk, the deaf would hear, and the dead would be raised, Lord. More power. More, Lord. God, I thank you for her heart, Lord. I thank you for this heart of compassion that there is. God, I pray as she walks down corridors that the demons would flee, Lord, that these spirits of infirmity would, would just flee, that they would know that she is the host of the territorial spirit for wherever she walks, Lord. She is the host. She is hosting the Holy Spirit who is the territorial spirit and everywhere that we set our feet that's that's actually what that scripture is talking about where that he will give you the land of wherever your feet um you know are, are walking on it's because you you host the the territorial spirit the earth is the lord's on the fullness thereof so god i i pray for an increase of that power of that authority dunamis an exousia, Lord, dunamis and exousia, both walking hand in hand, the authority to not be phased by everything that she sees, but also the power to shift it. Increase, Lord, increase. I actually feel that God's restoring a voice to you, that he's restoring your voice that that, that has been, you know, quietened for, for a while, that he's actually, so that the, what I'm hearing what I'm hearing in the spirit is a roar. So I'm hearing a, a roar in the in the spirit realm that's actually God is restoring your roar. Now, I don't know if you know this, but lions don't roar this way. Lions actually roar into the ground to, to let the territory know that there's a new king around. So God, I pray that her voice would be restored, that her roar would be res restored in Jesus' name. Fire and glory, Lord. Fire and glory. More. Jesus. So you you have you have you're a woman who has seen the goodness of God. You're a woman who has testimonies to the goodness of God. And and the the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, and it is by repeating these testimonies at times when it looks like nothing. It's repeating these testimonies of, but my God, but my God. Yes, Lord, more. Power and authority right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. More. Shira Mosanda. Hold on. Let it come, Lord. More, Lord, more. Yeah. Jesus. Increase, Lord. Increase the testimonies. Increase the testimonies. In Jesus' name. Why don't you all just stand? I bless you. You guys have a heart for healing.
like there is a heart for healing right right in everything I feel that you're doing. So, so God, I just pray. God, I pray that you would raise up a standard here, Lord, that you would raise up a standard for your goodness. Like not to man, but for your goodness, that you would be known as the, a good father who hates sickness. And that we wouldn't cooperate with any acknowledgement whatsoever that this, with any, with any sense that you're sending sickness in order to teach us something, God, because you're not doing that. Lord, that, that you despise sickness so much that you created Tylenol. And we're going to after it with everything we possibly can. But God, God, signs and wonders. This is a house of signs and wonders and miracles. Not, it's not a house that was a house of signs and wonders and miracles. That you have not been this way before. You think you've been this way before, but you have not been this way before. What does it look like? Listen, if you had a 20% success rate in every healing, you would have kings and queens come into this house with 20%, one in five. You would have the wealthiest people around trying to buy that gift from you. Kings and queens from all over the, the world, the minute their kid gets sick, they would, they would end up here. Can you handle that? Can you be that people on the inside that you're going to be on the outside? So God, bless us and keep us. Make your face shine upon us and give us peace. Amen. Wow. A lot to, to chew on, amen. So, wow. Praise God. That was so excellent. Hallelujah. So remember, tomorrow... Um, uh, supernatural school session from 1.30 to around 4 and then um, on Sunday morning and I just look forward to both of these sessions and times so very powerful stuff wow praise God so was that great amen I mean such a great word on so many levels uh, that we all need amen Praise God. Well, thank you for coming tonight on a Friday night, and uh, we appreciate that so much. You guys have a great evening, and we will see you tomorrow and or Sunday. Amen? So check out the product table, some good stuff. So praise God. Bless you guys.